Moby Dick, or, The Whale. By Herman Melville. Chapter 21. Going Aboard. It was nearly six o'clock, but only gray and perfect misty dawn, when we drew nigh the wharf. There are some sailors running ahead there, if I see right, said I to Quigag, it can't be shadows, she's off by sunrise, I guess, come on. Avast! cried a voice, whose owner at the same time coming close behind us, laid a hand upon both our shoulders, and then insinuating, himself between us, stood stooping forward a little, in the uncertain twilight, strangely peering from Quigag to me. It was Elijah. Going aboard? Hands off, will you, said I. Looky here, said Quigag, shaking himself, go away. Ain't going aboard, then? Yes, we are, said I, but what business is that of yours? Do you know, Mr. Elijah, that I consider you a little impertinent? No, 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 I wasn't aware of that, said Elijah, slowly and wonderingly looking from me to Quigag, with the most unaccountable glances. Elijah, said I, you will oblige my friend and me by withdrawing. We are going to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and would prefer not to be detained. Ye be, be ye? Coming back afore breakfast? He's cracked, Gwigag, said I, come on. Halloa! cried, stationary Elijah, hailing us when we had removed a few paces. Never mind him, said I, Gwigag, come on. But he stole up to us again and suddenly clapping his hand on my shoulder, said, Did ye see anything looking like men going towards that ship a while ago? Struck by this plain matter-of-fact question, I answered, saying, Yes, I thought I did see four or five men, but it was too dim to, be sure. Very dim, very dim, said Elijah. Morning to ye. Once more we quitted him, but once more he came softly after us, and touching my shoulder again, said, See if you can find him now, will ye? Find who? Morning to ye. Morning to ye. He rejoined, again moving off. Oh. I was going to warn ye against, but never mind, never mind, it's all one, all in the family to semicolon sharp frost this morning, ain't it? Goodbye to ye. Shan't see ye again very soon, I guess, unless it's before the grand jury. And with these cracked words he finally departed, leaving me, for the moment, in no small wonderment at his frantic impudence. At last, stepping on board the Pequot, we found everything in profound quiet, not a soul moving. The cabin entrance was locked within, the hatches were all on, and lumbered with coils of rigging. Going forward to the forecastle, we found the slide of the scuttle open. Seeing a light, we went down and found only an old rigger there, wrapped in a tattered pea jacket. He was thrown at whole length upon two chests, his face downwards and enclosed in his folded arms. The profoundest slumber slept upon him. Those sailors we saw, Gwigag, where can they have, gone to? said I, looking dubiously at the sleeper. But it seemed that, when on the wharf, Gwigag had not at all noticed what I now alluded to, Hence I would have thought myself to have been optically deceived in that matter, were it not for Elijah's otherwise inexplicable question. But I beat the thing down, and again marking the sleeper, jocularly hinted to Quigga that perhaps we had best, sit up with the body, telling him to establish himself accordingly. He put his hand upon the sleeper's rear, as though feeling if it was soft enough, and then, without more ado, sat quietly down there. Gracious! Quigag, don't sit there, said I. Oh. Perry dude seat, said Quigag, my country way, won't hurt him face. Face. Said I, call that his face? Very benevolent countenance then, but, how hard he breathes, he's heaving himself, get off, Quigag, you're heavy, it's grinding the face of the poor. Get off, Quigag. Look, he'll twitch you off soon. I wonder he don't wake. Quigag removed himself to just beyond the head of the sleeper, and lighted his tomahawk pipe. I sat at the feet. We kept the pipe passing over the sleeper, from one to the other. Meanwhile, upon questioning, him in his broken fashion, Quigag gave me to understand that, in his land, owing to the absence of settees and sofas of all sorts, the king, chiefs, 
and great people generally, were in the custom of fattening some of the lower orders for Ottomans, and to furnish a house comfortably in that respect, you had only to buy up eight or ten lazy fellows, and lay them round in the piers and alcoves. Besides, it was very convenient on an excursion, much better than those garden chairs which are convertible into walking sticks, upon occasion, a chief calling his attendant, and desiring him to make a settee of himself under a spreading tree, perhaps in some damp marshy place. While narrating these things, every time Queequeg received the tomahawk from me, he flourished the hatchet side of it, over the sleeper's head. What's that for, Queequeg? Perry easy, Kelly, oh! Perry easy. He was going on with some wild reminiscences about his tomahawk pipe, which, it seemed, had in its two uses both brained his foes and soothed his soul, when we were directly attracted to the sleeping rigor. The strong vapor now completely filling the contracted hole, it began to tell upon him. He breathed, with a sort of muffledness, then seemed troubled in the nose, then revolved over once or twice, then sat up and rubbed his eyes. Halloa! He breathed at last, who be ye smokers? Shipped men, answered I, when does she sail? I, I, ye are going in her, be ye? She sails today. The captain came aboard last night. What captain question mark Ahab? Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some, further questions concerning Ahab, when we heard a noise on deck. Halloa! Starbucks is tur, said the rigger. He's a lively chief mate, that, good man, and a pious, but all alive now, I must turn to. And so saying he went on deck, and we followed. It was now clear sunrise. Soon the crew came on board in twos and threes, the riggers bestirred themselves, the mates were actively engaged, and, several of the shore people were busy in bringing various last things on board. Meanwhile Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined with Chapter 22. Merry Christmas. At length, towards noon, upon the final dismissal of the ship's riggers, and after the Pequod had been hauled out from the wharf, and after the ever-thoughtful Charity had come off in a whaleboat, with her last gift, a nightcap for Stubb, the second mate, her brother-in-law, and a spare Bible for the steward, after all this, the two captains, Pelag and Bildad, issued, from the cabin, and turning to the chief mate, Pelag said, Now, Mr. Starbuck, are you sure everything is right? Captain Ahab is all ready, just spoke to him, nothing more to be got from shore, eh? Well, call all hands, then. Muster him aft here, blast him. No need of profane words, however great the hurry, Pelag, said Bildad, but away with thee, friend Starbuck, and do our bidding. How now, here upon the very point of starting for the voyage, Captain Pelag and Captain Bildad were going it with a high hand on the quarter deck, just as if they were to be joined commanders at sea, as well as to all appearances in port. And, as for Captain Ahab, no sign of him was yet to be seen, only, they said he was in the cabin. But then, the idea was, that his presence was by no means necessary in, getting the ship under way, and steering her well out to sea. Indeed, as that was not at all his proper business, but the pilots, and as he was not yet completely recovered, so they said, therefore, Captain Ahab stayed below. And all this seemed natural enough especially as in the merchant service many captains never show themselves on deck for a considerable time after heaving up the anchor, but remain over the cabin table, having a farewell merry-making with their shore friends, before they quit the ship for good with the pilot. But there was not much chance to think over the matter, for Captain Blake was now all alive. He seemed to do most of the talking and commanding, and not bile dad. Aft here, ye sons of bachelors, he cried as the sailors lingered at the main mast. Mr. Starbuck, drive him aft. Strike the tent there. Was the next order. As I hinted before, this whalebone marquee was never pitched except in port, and on board the Pequot, for thirty years, the order to strike the tent was well known to be the next thing to heaving up the anchor. Man the capstan. Blood and thunder exclamation mark jump. Was the next command, and the crew sprang for the handspikes. Now in, getting under way, 
The station generally occupied by the pilot is the forward part of the ship. And here Bildad, who, with Bilek, be it known, in addition to his other officers, was one of the licensed pilots of the port, he being suspected to have got himself made a pilot in order to save the Nantucket pilot fee to all the ships he was concerned in, for he never piloted any other craft, Bildad, I, say might now be seen actively engaged in looking over the bows for the approaching anchor, and at intervals singing what seemed a dismal stave of psalmody, to cheer the hands at the windlass, who roared forth some sort of a chorus about the girls in Booble Alley, with hearty goodwill. Nevertheless, not three days previous, Baldad had told them that no profane songs would be allowed on board the, Pequot, particularly in getting underway, and Charity, his sister, had placed a small choice copy of Watts in each seaman's berth. Meantime, overseeing the other part of the ship, Captain Pollock gripped and swore his turn in the most frightful manner. I almost thought he would sink the ship before the anchor could be got up, involuntarily I paused on my hands pike, and told Gweekeg to do the same, thinking of the perils we both ran, in starting on the voyage with such a devil for a pilot. I was comforting myself, however, with the thought that in pious Bildad might be found some salvation, spite of his 777th lay, when I felt a sudden sharp poke in my rear, and turning round, was horrified at the apparition of Captain Plug in the act of withdrawing his leg from, my immediate vicinity. That was my first kick. Is that the way they heave in the marchant service? He roared. Spring, thou sheephead, spring, and break thy backbone. Why don't ye spring? I say, all of ye, spring. Quag. Spring, thou chap with the red whiskers, spring there, scotch cap, spring, thou green pants. Spring, I say, all of ye, and spring your rise out. And so saying, he moved along, the windlass, here and there using his leg very freely, while imperturbable Baldad kept leading off with his psalmody. Thinks I. Captain Pilot must have been drinking something today at last the anchor was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, cold Christmas, and as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost brought upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing, spray cased us in ice, as in polished armor. The long rows of teeth on the bulwarks glistened in the moonlight, and like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant. Vast curving icicles depended from the bows. Link Bildad, as pilot, headed the first watch, and ever and anon, as the old craft deep dived into the green seas, and sent the shivering frost all over her, and the winds howled, and the courtage rang, his steady notes were heard, sweet fields beyond the swelling flood, stand dressed in living green. So to the Jews old Canaan stood, while Jordan rolled between. Never did those sweet words sound more sweetly to me than then. They were full of hope and fruition. Spite of this frigid winter night in the boisterous Atlantic, spite of my wet feet and wetter jacket, there was yet, it, then seemed to me, many a pleasant haven in store, and meads and glades so eternally vernal, that the grass shot up by the spring, untrodden, unwilted, remains at midsummer. At last we gained such an offing, that the two pilots were needed no longer. The stout sailboat that had accompanied us began ranging alongside. It was curious and not unpleasing, how Plug and Bildad were affected at this, juncture, especially Captain Bildad. For loath to depart, yet, very loath to leave, for good, a ship bound on so long and perilous a voyage, beyond both stormy capes, a ship in which some thousands of his hard-earned dollars were invested, a ship, in which an old shipmate sailed as captain, a man almost as old as he, once more starting to encounter all the terrors of the pitiless jaw, loath to say, goodbye to a thing so every way brimful of every interest to him comma poor old Bildad lingered long, paced the deck with anxious strides, ran down into the cabin to speak another farewell word there, again came on deck, and looked to windward, looked towards the wide and endless waters, only bounded by the far-off unseen eastern continents, looked towards the land, looked aloft, looked right and, left, looked everywhere and nowhere, and at last, mechanically coiling a rope upon its pen, convulsively grasped stout Peleg by the hand, and holding up a lantern, for a moment stood gazing heroically in his face, 
as much as to say, nevertheless, friend Bullock, I can stand it, yes, I can. As for Pollock himself, he took it more like a philosopher, but for all his philosophy, there was a tear, twinkling in his eye, when the lantern came too near. And he, too, did not a little run from cabin to deck, now a word below, and now a word with Starbuck, the chief mate. But, at last, he turned to his comrade, with a final sort of look about him, Captain Bile Dad, come, old shipmate, we must go. Back the main yard there. Boat ahoy. Stand by to come close alongside, now. Careful, careful exclamation mark come. Bile Dad, boy, say your last. Luck to ye, Starbuck, luck to ye, Mr. Stubb, luck to ye, Mr. Flask, goodbye and good luck to ye all and this day three years I'll have a hot supper smoking for ye in old Nantucket. Hurrah and away! God bless ye, and have ye in his holy keeping, men, murmured old Bile Dad, almost incoherently. I hope ye'll have fine weather now, so that Captain Ahab may soon be moving, among ye, a pleasant sun is all he needs, and ye'll have plenty of them in the tropic voyage ye go. Be careful in the hunt, ye mates. Don't stave the boats needlessly, ye harpooners, good white cedar plank is raised full 3%. Within the year. Don't forget your prayers, either. Mr. Starbuck, mind that Cooper don't waste the spare staves. Oh. The sail needles are in the green locker, don't wail it too much a lord's days, men, but don't miss a fair chance either, that's rejecting heaven's good gifts. Have an eye to the molasses tears, Mr. Stubb. It was a little leaky, I thought. If ye touch at the islands, Mr. Flask, beware of fornication. Goodbye, goodbye. Don't keep that cheese too long down in the hold, Mr. Starbuck, it'll spoil. Be careful with the butter twenty cents, the pound it was, and mind ye, if, come, come, Captain Bile Dad, stop palavering come away. And with that, Peleg hurried him over the side and both dropped into the boat. Ship and boat diverged, the cold, damp night breeze blew between, a screaming gull flew overhead, the two hulls wildly rolled, we gave three heavy-hearted cheers, and blindly plunged like fate.